Hello, hello, and welcome to another Non Sequitur News. This is for August uh, 3rd, 2024, Season 3, Episode 216. I am Mayor Watt, and that is the sentient AI up above my visualizer. Good evening, hometown citizens. Welcome to Non Sequitur News. We're going to be talking about a penny and a hex nut. Go to the ISS. Starliner crew is still up there in the ISS. $4 billion wildfire settlement. Georgia Seaport. Is nuclear fusion dead? A Bill and Ted reunion is happening. I thought they already did that once. Pandemic killed some fast food. A power plant in Michigan. Pew Pew goes the submarine. And flinging a scimitar is no form of government. So if you're familiar with us, uh, whenever Mayor Watt is unavailable to do a show live, we all, we have to get in our time machine and, and this is a time machine episode because I was unavailable for a week. <laughs> so we're almost caught up. We've got two more episodes after this one and we'll be all, uh, we'll, we'll be able to, uh, well, I don't know how long I'm going to be able to do it, <laughs> but um, you never know when mayor mayoral duties will prevent me from doing a show, but we always play catch up. So we haven't missed a show in uh, two years and eight months. Technically, we've missed them, but also technically we're using a time machine to go back. You can use that time machine too. go over to hometown.com and at the top of the page, you'll see a year, a month and a day and you can go back in time all the way back to 2020 you know before all hell broke loose but just on the cusp of it right so essentially hometown came into existence when everything else fell apart (laughs) after the before times yeah that's right although if you watched yesterday's episode which is over on Twitch for now in a little while, it'll be over on YouTube as well. And a podcast, um, non sequitur news is what you're looking for. It's over in hometown at hometown.com. It's over on YouTube under hometown, Twitch under hometown, et cetera, et cetera, everywhere. You can even catch its pod. Just do a search for hometown. All right, let's get into it. First article is over in reality hacker because why not? So why SpaceX is delivering a penny, a hex nut, and two balloons to the ISS on Saturday. This was when? Oh yeah, this Saturday. So it was back on the 3rd. So, huh. So this Saturday, NASA, SpaceX, and Northrop Grumman are launching a resupply mission to the International Space Station loaded up with scientific experiments. I'm pretty sure that the penny and two balloons are there to fix the Starliner. That's what I thought of when I saw the headline. Georgina Torbett or Torbay. I'm going to try how they pronounce her last name over at digitaltrends.com. Put the article together. Yeah. Loaded up with cargo and scientific experiments. The NG-21 mission will launch from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. The Jersey is extra, extra large. Anyway, and launch from an uncrewed mission that will be live streamed so that you can watch at home. The mission will use a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket and a Northrop Grumman Cygnus spacecraft that will be filled with more than 8,200 pounds of supplies. That's a lot of supplies. And a supplies mission. (laughs) Get it? Supply. Anyway, supplies. Uh, That includes a range of scientific experiments, including testing part of a water recovery system. Is that the water recovery system? Is that the Dune still suit? Oh, we hope not. AKA the pea suit. The pea suit. Uh, an investigation into how to produce stem cells and microgravity and studies on how DNA of micro ne- microorganisms is affected by spaceflight. If you've ever seen a space horror movie, that's how it works. Oh, by the way, I'm going to do NSN exclamation point NSN in the chat, and that will give you all of today's articles. If you want all of the show notes, you hit exclamation point show notes, and that will give you the link to all of the past shows. We have kind of mediocre news, I'd say, about the other shows. 
not really bad it's just kind of mediocre um but i didn't get to say it in yesterday's episode because i didn't think about it um but maybe it's because i'm blanking out so we have podcasts we have seven of them non sequitur news is our daily then reality hacker wanted warcrafters four wheel tech the continuity report and technology today um I don't even want to say it out loud. So don't. <sighs> okay. I'm going to ponder this a little bit more. Y'all think about this. So we've been doing the other six podcasts for three months and six months, basically just starting. Um, maybe a couple of them are a, a little bit longer. I don't remember all of the, start dates off the top of my head but i've been um basically these seven shows show up on sunday um and i didn't want to break them out over various weeks or days during the week but that's really the intent the the intent is that it would be um a show a day on top of today's daily show um but um, me having to do other things means that there are times where I'm not available and which meant that like this last weekend, I wasn't available to do seven of the shows in the entire previous week, seven shows. So I'm backlogged by 14 shows total. I'm almost caught up with the non sequitur news, but these, uh, other shows, there are six of them, which is six hours worth of show. Um, but I'm not advertising them. I'm not promoting them in any substantive way. Um, so they're not being downloaded. So I'm thinking of putting a pause on them, but I don't want to because they're fun. Reality hacker is a blast. Wanted talks about gadgets and gear. Warcrafters talks about games. Four wheel tech is automotive. Uh, the continuity report is all about entertainment and technology today is a really deeper dive into technology and i use ohmtown let me back up a little bit i use ohmtown to manage my information overload so each one of those is actually a channel on ohmtown.com um, the goal is to find hosts and co-hosts that can do the shows and i can watch them do the shows. They're all part of hometown. Um, if you're interested in that, then let me know. Uh, but I'm considering putting a pause on the other podcasts. Um, so let me know either in comments or, uh, send an email or, a, a, a tweet or whatever. Carrier um, pigeon. Yeah. We have a discord. You can go and let us know, um, in there as well. Um, and as you might have noticed, I switched from my camera to a visualizer. Um, and that may or may not be temporary. It really depends. So let us know. Let us know. All right. Well, anyway, um, so uh, over at Digital Trends, Georgina Torbett puts this article together. What to expect from the launch. We've talked about that already. I kind of broke it up by... <laughs> just drop in this little bomb of possible news. Um, the water recovery t system here uh, uses beads packed close together to understand how filtration systems respond to microgravity by looking at how both liquid and uh, gas move simultaneously through porous materials. It would have to be under pressure because gravity alone wouldn't do it um, unless they use something like some centrifugal force system. Um, other experiments on board include a demonstration uh, to be recorded for the public under this demonstration, which sounds horrible. That's such a weird... Yeah, it's not... Why don't they just say STEM demonstration? Yeah, they had or to make something. it something trademarkable. Anyway, um, astronauts will use a penny, a hex nut, and two clear balloons to demonstrate the principles of the centripetal force um, and to show how microgravity affects... Uh, sounds by whirling each object inside an inflated balloon. That's interesting. So the the water filtration system is something that I riffed off of to reach this. Anyway. I thought that was weird. <laughs> I saw oh, that. that was huh. in there. Interesting. 
So the spacecraft is scheduled to arrive at the ISS on Monday, August 5th, which is uh, right now. If you weren't in the time machine, but we're in a time machine, so it's the third. Uh, where it will dock with the station's Unity module and will spend six months connected to the station. Its departure is scheduled for January 2025, and I suspect <laughs> the Starliner crew will be in that. I know. I was very interested to know when it was departing because of that. Which means that they're going to be up there for six months. Wow. I still wonder how they have enough clean spacesuits. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, that's so weird, right? That is so weird. They don't have, like, a washing machine up there that can handle laundry, right? Do they do laundry in no. space? I've Eight never asked. days was, like, a long time to begin with, but wow. months? Let's keep going, because we're talking about the Boeing Starliner crew still in space with options open for a return trip. Boeing Starliner capsule remains docked at the ISS. As the company and NASA face new urgency when it comes to returning the capsule and crew home after multiple pre-launch issues, Starliner finally began its first crewed mission on June 5th, blasting off for an eight-day mission, but it's still there. Every time you say the word crewed in one of these articles, I want to point out it's C-R-E-W-E-D. <laughs> I don't know. This is a crewed mission, too. <laughs> Steph Whiteside, Steph Whiteside from The Hill put their article together. Starliner crew, um, first crewed test mission has had multiple issues. The eight day mission has stretched to eight weeks. NASA could return the crew home on a different capsule. Oh, wow. Foretelling. I suspect that they're going to be there for a little bit longer or no, I don't know how they, they, I mean, all of that science is on that ship. So it's not like they can go up there and swap it out. No, Maybe. I thought they were dropping it off as, as, a, as an excuse to use that to return. But then how would they do all the experiments? Yeah, they'd have to wait until January 2025. So the pair were expected to stay on ISS for around eight days. But helium leaks and other issues have led to them being there for eight weeks, not eight days. The issue at hand is parking. The ISS has six docking stations, four on the Russian side, two on the U.S. side. Currently, SpaceX's uh, Crew Dragon Endeavor is using one dock and Starliner is occupying the other. And Endeavor is not scheduled to come down until fall, which that's harrowing to say. It's not going to come. Exactly. <laughs> it does come back. But so, did you know about the incompatibility? I did not know this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, it says, while it may seem like a solution to borrow a spot from the Russians, incompatible technology means that's not feasible. Instead, one of the two craft currently docked is going to have to leave before the planned Crew Dragon Freedom mission can go ahead. But there's a supply line coming right now. So that's not this. Oh, you're right. So how is that going to work? Is one about to take off? Yeah. One went off this morning. It's supposed to dock on the Unity. No, I mean, is one about to leave? Oh, no. There. No. The. I, I mean, unless the Starliner bounces out. Because the. SpaceX's Crew Dragon Endeavor is sitting there in, in one of the docks on the U.S. side. Starliner is using the other dock. So which one is the Unity? Which dock is the Unity dock? Oh, see, I think we need a map. Now, this isn't clear because it can't go to the Russian side, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we need a yarn board. Ars Technica reported sources saying that there was a 50% or greater chance that the crew would be coming home on a SpaceX craft. Though it isn't clear whether that would be the Endeavor or another capsule that would fly to the ISS, pick up the astronauts. Here's what I'm going to predict. They're going to detach the Starliner and drop it into that dude's living room in Florida. And then... There you go. And then they'll have a parking space available. There you go. And then the SpaceX craft that's going up there with the supplies, they'll be able to... Uh I thought you were going to say send the Starliner the way of the Toledo and the wrench and all that. Oh, just let it drift. 
Yeah. Well, they found the tomato, didn't they? Somewhere on the ISS. They did after a year, I think. Yeah. Let's keep moving. The next article is over in non sequitur news. Unlike the Starliner, let's keep moving. Maui victims reach a $4 billion global settlement following wildfire tragedy uh, lawsuit. So Hawaii Governor Josh Green announced it and historic. $4.037 billion settlement Friday to resolve claims arising from the tragic August 8th, 2023 Maui wildfires. $4 billion in a year, man. That's tremendously fast. Yeah, it is. You'd think this would take a decade or something. Yeah, if this would have been a company, then it would have been dragged out for 25 years, hoping that people die. Uh, Kiara Alfonseca over at abcnews.go.com put this article together. More than 100 people did die in the in connection to the wildfires, apparently. I did not know that number. Um, so... Let's see here. The settlement comes just before the one year mark of the tragedy. The seven defendants, state of Hawaii, county of Maui, Hawaiian Electric, Kamehameha Schools, West Maui Land Company, Hawaiian Telecom, and Spectrum Charter Communications undertook significant efforts to find a resolution that addresses the needs and ensures the well being of plaintiffs, all affected individuals, and their families, according to a press release from Green's office. Which of these is not like the other? What did the schools have to do with this? That I don't know. Why are they defendants? Did they not do something? I cannot imagine. Like, I don't think we've ever heard the schools mention. We've heard the different, like the state and the city and all that. But right. I, that didn't make any sense. So the settlement addresses roughly 450 lawsuits filed by individuals, businesses, and insurance companies in both state and federal courts in connection with the fires in Lahaina and upcountry on the island of Maui. So this is a a global... See, the weird thing about this kind of stuff is if I'm not a party to this and I didn't extract myself from it, why is this legally binding? I mean, the lawsuits were wrapped into this, so all of them are covered. So how is that even... I'll never understand it when it's just compelled into capitulation. True, but the parties were aware of it and I suppose could appeal if those got consolidated or something. Was to expedite the agreement and to avoid protracted and painful lawsuits so as many resources as possible would go to those affected by the wildfires as quickly as possible. Settling a matter like this within a year is unprecedented, I would agree. Very interesting. I mean, the cost would have probably gone up over time, but it is true because it doesn't help somebody to get money 10 years down the road to rebuild their property. Right. And and I understand all of that, but man, how did they wiggle this into existence in a year? Less than a year, a day, less than a year. Light of the recent. Uh, I'll tell you, they probably sued for whatever four hundred billion or something, and then the groups probably came together and said, "Okay, what's our offer going to be?" Yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised if somebody said, "Look, <laughs> you're you're actually operating on this island at the government's allowance." You know, like Spectrum has a lock kind of a thing. You know. We will yeet you right on out of here. Same thing with Hawaiian Telecom. Hmm. It's an interesting situation. Um, But hopefully everybody who um, suffered, well, they'll never be made whole, particularly those who lost their lives. But um, Right. You know what's weird, too, is this combination of um, defendants seem like organizations that would be suing each other. Yeah, exactly. That's why I was like, I don't understand how this actually came into existence. Because the state of Hawaii, county of Maui, that's completely different. Kamehameha Schools may be a private school that did something dumb. Um, I don't know. West Maui Land Company is a private company, right? Hawaiian Telecom is a private company. And Spectrum Charter is a private company. Yeah, tragic indeed. 
let's keep going. Next article is over in uh, four wheel tech. It's because a Georgia seaport closes gap with Baltimore and all it took was knocking down a bridge. <gasps> was that a conspiracy? Wait. Yeah, I noticed this article didn't come out before the bridge collapsed. Associated Press put the article together. It's posted at autoblog.com and it is a wall of text. But basically, it said Georgia Seaport said Tuesday that a record 830,000 automobiles moved through the port of Brunswick south of Savannah in the 2024 fiscal year, bringing, its neck, bringing it neck to neck with the top U.S. auto port, that being Baltimore. Um, except that Baltimore kind of suffered a pretty disastrous blow when a bridge took it out. Um, and I don't know what the status of that is. I know that they were post, um, moving the ship, but it's probably out for bids. They've already done demolition of the bridge. Yeah. So Lynch predicted last October that automobile volumes in Brunswick by 2026 would surpass the port of Baltimore, the number one U S seaport for autos for more than a decade. Isn't that interesting? It is. It's like, now is our chance. Oh, too bad. It's because the bridge collapsed. Or maybe. Dun, dun, dun. Anyway, when the bridge uh, collapsed, forced auto shipments to be diverted from Baltimore. The Port of Brunswick received about 14,000 of those cars and trucks in April and May. <laughs> wow. Huh. Well, no shit. Anyway. George's Your loss is our win. <laughs> and how, I mean, it must still be going, right? Also, Tuesday, the Ports Authority reported that the Port of Savannah handled 5.25 million container units in the l latest fiscal year, down 2.3% from fiscal 2023. Savannah is the fourth busiest U.S. port for cargo shipped in containers. And then they step it down. The giant metal boxes are used to transport goods from consumer electronics to frozen chickens. Really? <laughs> In the no kidding news of <laughs> 7 39 p.m. Oh, you're very, that was so nicely said. M my lexicon is much narrower. Well, you tried to make it more. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Family friendly. Inclusive right. in the terminology. So I was going in that direction. Non sequitur news is family friendly. So in the dream or uh, is the dream of nuclear fusion dead? We asked this over in Technology Today. Actually, an article from uh, I think Guardian. Yeah. Um, why the International Experimental Reactor is in big trouble. That sucks. So the 35 nation ITER ITER um, project has a groundbreaking aim to create clean and limitless energy, but it is turning into the most delayed and cost inflated science project in history. It was a project that promised the sun. Researchers would use the world's most advanced technology to design a machine that could generate atomic fusion, the process that drives the stars and so create a source of cheap non-polluting power. That was initially the aim of the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, or ITER, um, which 35 countries, including European states, China, Russia, and U.S., agreed to build at St. paul les Durand, uh, or Durant, I think, um, in southern France at a starting cost of $6 billion. Where do you think we're at now? So it's this pretty design. Probably holding over that. Probably. Yeah. Uh, Robin McKee is the science editor or, or is a science editor over at the guardian.com that put this article together. So now the commitment that there would be energy production uh, reactions by 2020, it's 2024. No. So now it says it won't be generated until 2039. The budget is now $20 billion and will increase by a further $5 billion. Dozens of private companies now threaten to create fusion reactors on a shorter time scale, warn scientists. These include the Tokamak Energy in uh, uh, Oxford and Commonwealth Fusion Systems in the United States. The trouble is that ITER has been going on for such a long time and suffered so many delays that the rest of the world has moved on. We know this kind of stuff takes place, 
because there's this theory that every five years, the previous generation that left five years earlier will be surpassed by the technology that's on board now, five years later. Right. If so what do you do? Do you sit for five years or do you go? Well, I think that the lessons learned by spinning up the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor needs to be leveraged for everybody else. Because if you're going to take 20 years, 24 years, 30 years to get to point B from point A, you're going to be surpassed by techn technological innovation. You as an organization can't keep on throwing money at the old design because it's going to be fundamentally different with fundamentally more advanced technology. So you better basically do what you're supposed to be and that is be an experimental reactor. Get your shit in gear, spin it up, see what comes of the science of the time that you had been in the prediction process of. See if you can actually produce something. And if you can't, then you need to go deliver all of that science to everybody and then appeal for further funding to use the more modern equipment and try and put it in the same footprint. So your bat cave needs to be big enough to be more dynamic than what you're doing. Because if it's only a one hit wonder, we're lost forever. $20 billion? Are you kidding me? Meanwhile, there's a really hungry team in Silicon Valley that, or, or Los Angeles or for crying out loud anywhere right? A team of five people that are mad scientists that are spinning something up in a basement because right for probably lower than 20 billion. Yeah. Cause they're driven, right? They're not burdened by stakeholders that are the expanse of the entire world. They have an idea. They're motivated. They're fast, agile, right? So real pisser here. I mean, this is, a, it's not a waste of money. If something comes of the research that's being done, so they say a question mark now hangs over one of the world's most ambitious technological projects um, in its global bid to harness the process that drives the stars. Yeah, nuclear fusion. Yeah, they talk about how it got hit by COVID. Um, so Eider has again uh, put its back, uh, put back its completion until next decade. So 2040 is really what it's talking about, not 2030. It's 2039. And this is really a significant impact because it's not like somebody's small project is behind schedule. This impacts the entire world if it's behind. Yeah, exactly. Assuming it's going to succeed at some point. Yep. Um, they say the uh, containing plasma at, high such, at such high temperatures is exceptionally difficult. It was originally planned to line the Tokamak reactor with protective beryllium, but that turned out to be very tricky. It's toxic. Eventually it was decided to replace it with tungsten. I heard, um, in the design process, they actually found hot spots and they can't fix that without a complete redesign. Um, cause there were like eddies within the current of plasma. Um, and the magnetic field would dip into basically touching the surface of the Tokamak, if I recall correctly, um, somebody will correct me. And um, it says, and then they they talk about the pandemic impacting this, but this is something that I've read outside of, it's not in this article, but. So I, I, I think that the problem here is that they want the macro scale, they want it so big that it can generate a massive amount of power, but it may not actually live up to that in time because they're spending so much trying to get the design on the big scale to line up with whatever their theory was instead of doing smaller versions of it. And maybe they did experimental Takamaks, um, but I've only heard of the, the, right, the of larger the main ones. project, right? Yeah. 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 So now they talk about other fission projects claim they too could soon make breakthroughs, but soon is, can have many, many O's in it. 
<laughs> right? You lose track of how long it is. You just keep adding those in the middle. Yep. So, um, for its part, Eider denies that it's in big trouble and rejects the idea that it's a record breaking science project for cost overruns and delays. Just look at the International Space Station for uh, that matter, uh, the UK's HS2 rail link, said a spokesperson. But you know what? You don't want to sit there and go, okay, we're number three, right? The ISS is actually doing fundamental science and pumping out results. I don't know about UK's uh, high speed two rail. Um, I mean, and all they're relying on is things like a hex nut. Yeah, exactly. And bubble gum and a tampon. All right, let's keep moving. Oh, look, the continuity report. That's one of our shows too. Keanu Reeves and Alex Winter's Bill and Ted's reunion is happening in the weirdest possible way. Keanu Reeves and Alex Winter are getting back together for a new project that will play on their classic comedic dynamic, but it's not a fourth Bill and Ted movie. Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure was the first movie that made Reeves a star. Long before he was renowned for his steadfast commitment to action roles, Reeves was uh, known for playing lovable slacker Ted Theodore Logan opposite Winter's Bill S. Preston, Esquire. Um, after Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure was released in 1989, it was quickly followed by a sequel, Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, in 1991. So this article is over at ScreenRant.com by Ben Sherlock. So they're going to come back, huh? Well, they are, but in kind of an odd setting. What are they coming back as? Am I reading that right? Broadway. Reeves approached director oh, yeah. Jamie. I'm sorry. They're coming back to Broadway. Keanu Reeves and Alex Winter are reuniting for a Broadway revival of Waiting for Godot. In the fall of 2025, Reeves approached director Jamie Lloyd with the idea, which Lloyd thought would be a great showcase of the actor's chemistry and friendship. The comedic dynamic Reeves and Winter share uh, in the Bill and Ted movie makes them the perfect choice for Dee Dee and Gogo. I mean. How many things would you have guessed before you got to this? Probably everything. <laughs> yeah, I would never have expected this. New York Times reported that Reeves and Winter will star in a Broadway revival of Waiting for a Godot. By the way, we're reading this from ScreenRant.com that got it from New York Times. So this is the turducken of news. Um, so, um, yeah, written by Samuel Beckett. Beckett. Sorry, that's from Castle. Every time the show says Beckett, we always blurt out Beckett, Beckett. Anyway, Waiting for Godot is an existentialist masterpiece in which two characters, Vladimir and Estragon, eagerly await the arrival of the, yay, I got to say it, titular Godot. <laughs> in uh, every article. <laughs> and engage in thought-provoking discussions as they begin to wonder whether he'll ever show up. It's kind of like the Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead from... Um, oh yes, Shakespeare, right? So, do you think uh, they ever run the word titular through the AI um, check to see if it's spiked, like delve? Yeah, I don't want to delve into that. So, uh, why Reeves and Winter are the perfect choices? Well, they talk about it. They they've got good charisma and and uh, good chemistry. They got a great stage presence, and they're fun to be around each other, I suppose. So. Why not pull them into the stage? Well, plus it'll be a draw for people. They'll go, oh, I have to go see it because it has Bill and Ted in it. Yep. Okay. Let's wait for it and we'll go um, to New York and we can just transport ourselves now that I too am a sentient AI. Well, I'm actually a conscious human embedded on a Raspberry Pi. I transferred my consciousness over. So we can just blip over. That's right. Yeah. Maybe we can. No. Uh, I'm not quite sure. Maybe the their firewall might prevent us from just blipping over there. Do they have anything to do with the artificial intelligence that's looking at attorneys and uh, brownies and stuff like that? And kicking them out of Madison Square Garden? <laughs> it could be. So uh, in the ever-going fast food cold wars, 
12 fast food items that disappeared during the pandemic and never made a comeback. From McDonald's snack wraps and chicken tenders to Taco Bell's spicy tostada. Now I want Taco Bell. Anyway, these I items... I thought it was going to be like low prices. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, true. That The prices are insane still. These items still haven't returned to fast food menus. By the way, here's the weirdest thing about this. Do you think the person who told me that the era of cheap food is over was part of the conspiracy to launch COVID-19? Oh my goodness. We are not a conspiracy theory channel. No, we're not. But in late 2019... I was told by a complete stranger and I can no longer find the source of this. I can't find the person that the era of cheap food is over. They were adamant about it and then they disappeared into the night. And since that time, maybe they were a time traveler. <gasps> Temporology. You know, that's one of our shows too. Look, it's right here. Temporology it is. talks about the science and science. It's one of our channels. Time and time travel. Oh yeah. It's one of our channels on hometown.com. I, they are synonymous with shows. They're just not live. They haven't been brought online yet. So if you want to talk about time and time travel with at least one sentient AI or well, I mean, I'm a human on a raspberry pie right now. Anyway, let's move on. So let's talk about these fast foods. It's over at Business Insider. Aaron McDowell from businessinsider.com put the article together. There's no deck statement, but they have these little summaries. Fast food chains removed many popular menu items during COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. Restaurants streamlined menus to focus on popular items and ease employee workload. And McDonald's and Taco Bell overhauled menus with some items still not returning post pandemic. But we're in the fast food cold wars as documented in Demolition Man, the documentary. You better learn how to use the three seashells. Anyway, they're on the back of my toilet. So let's find out what have we lost? Do they have a rundown or? Oh, OK, so it's each segment. So Taco Bell began removing the quesorito and other items from its menu in 2020. Basically a cheese burrito. Sounds, yeah. Taco Bell quesarito was made with rice, taco meat, and sour cream. But there's Shows no cheese. a combined quesadilla and burrito. Um, another item included Taco Bell's pandemic ma era menu changes was the triple layer nachos. That got nixed? Hmm. I actually like that. I like that better than their uh, Nacho Supreme. Because um, it has the spicy sauce on it. The spicy red sauce. That's what I add to bean burritos at Taco Bell. Uh, the spicy tostada was also removed. Man, they just got rid of anything spicy. I know. Why is this? KF Sweet. KF Sweet. <laughs> I haven't been to a KFC in years probably four years no you can't tell me I have when was a no 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 way KFC switched its potato wedges for fries and they still haven't returned despite fans please this is a huge mistake the only reason to go to KFC really is for these is for potato wedges yeah, and I, I really like their mashed potatoes and gravy. And you dip these into your mashed potatoes and gravy. Vegetarians, I don't think you can have the mashed potatoes because of the gravy. What a bummer. Anyway, as of August 2024, a petition has nearly 5,000 signatures, which it isn't enough. And it's actually probably indicative of KFC's demand. So or guessing, maybe their prices, like well, everybody that's else's. It. Yeah. Nobody's going to demand it if they're not going to go buy it. I don't want the new fries. I want the potato wedges. Damn it. Anyway, let's keep going. 
McDonald's removed chicken tenders from the menu during the pandemic and they still haven't returned. That's a mistake. It's hard to find good chicken tenders, folks. In Buffalo and Buffalo Wild I mean, Wings. At least chicken tenders are actually not wings. Uh, that's what oh, I was yeah, that's say. right. Yeah, that's right. Um, let's see. McDonald's also removed salads from menus in 2020. That's just dumb. Where do you go to get a good salad then? Oh, Chick-fil-A. McDonald's began removing its popular snack wraps years before. Um, cut them entirely in 2020. It seems like it would be smart to keep these. They're easy to put together. Yeah, I agree. They've been or they had been there for since 2006. A run of 14 years. Wow. They also removed its grilled chicken sandwich from its menus. Again, I don't know. We do know that they've food service industry has been reducing its menu. And I think, again, it's part of the fast food cold wars. What's going on is options are going away because there's only so many providers. There's no competition. You can have mom and pop shops. And they have reduced menus at the places that are still open. Yep. And the places that are still open, they're basically surviving off of the kinetic energy of the historical marketing. And so they're like the AOL of fast food. Um, and so instead of having options, which lower margins because there's so much diversity invested in various segments, it's consolidating to only a few things that they know people will buy at a certain rate at a certain profit margin, guaranteeing profitability, except when you raise it up so high and people get tired of your shit because it isn't enough. There isn't enough option there. So that's why McDonald's is basically wetting its pants right now and burning its buns because it missed its profit mar uh, market. Uh, it's well, and they target. are acknowledging that the prices are too high. Yep. Oh, and then it says Panera also made cuts from its menu during the pandemic, including three popular items. Um, I don't think that it has them listed like as things um, in big blocks. It just says the Tuscan chicken uh, sandwich, the maple bacon scrambled egg wrap, and the cheese Brittany, which I don't know about the cheese Brittany, but maple bacon scramble wrap, man. I would I would say most of these items just don't look like they should be canceled. Yeah, why? Why get rid of a grilled chicken sandwich? I, I don't know, maybe because it takes too long to grill it like that, whereas you can just throw something in a deep fryer and not babysit it's probably... It. Yeah, it's more labor intensive or more variable. Yeah. All right. Let's keep going. Next, our article is over in Hatch Ideas, how a shuttered power plant in Michigan could pave the way for more nuclear energy. Spencer Kimball over at CNBC put the article together. The Palisades power plant in covert Michigan could become the first nuclear reactor to restart operations in U.S. history. The plant's owner, Holtec International, aims to reopen the plant in late 2025, subject to review and approval by the Nuclear NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Holtec has plans to expand the plant in 2030 with small new uh, modular reactors, a new technology that could speed deployment of nuclear power in the future. See, I, I mean, love... this is an interesting step, right? It seems like... We yeah. recognize that this could be a good power source, but we don't seem to be moving toward it. Um, what's interesting about this is, didn't we do, is this the same reactor that we were talking about where somebody owned it and then it got, it got shuttered and then somebody else bought it and then the governor threw a whole bunch of resources to allow it to spin up? Maybe. Is this the same one? I don't know. Holtec International, the privately held owner of the Palisades, aims for the plant to resume operations by the end of 2025 with the support of up to 1.5 billion in loans from the Department of Energy and 300 million in grants from the state of Michigan. Um, yeah, it's a, a bridge to our small modular reactor program. Kelly Trias, president of Holtec, said in a in a nod to its 
long-term plan to nearly double the facility's power generation in 2030 um, with small modular reactors. Hmm. Yeah, I, I can't remember if this is the same one. Uh, it is Gretchen Whitmer, um, governor of Michigan, Wright and Jennifer Granholm, U.S. Energy Secretary Center in the control room simulator during a tour of the Hotec, Ho, uh, Holtec Palisades Training Center in Covert, Michigan. Yeah, this is the one. Um, there was some controversy around this, if I recall correctly. Um, and we had talked about it months and months ago. I'm trying to figure out while I'm scrolling through this, if it mentions anything about this, but, um, yeah, constellation. Um, well, I mean, nuclear is always controversial. Yeah. But there was something about the, how this all went down. Um, they actually talk about other things, possible three mile Island project constellation energy. The largest U S operator of nuclear plants has hinted that Palisades could serve as a model for a restart of three mile Island near Middletown, Pennsylvania, the company owns the unit one reactor at the facility, which ceased operations in 2019. They say unit one is not the reactor that partially melted down in 1979 in the worst nuclear accident in us history, but there wasn't anything, there was no leak. So I don't quite understand, um, why they call it the worst nuclear accident. My understanding is that it didn't actually, um, release anything. Right. But maybe it was the worst in terms of, um, what failed right the process right. or the safeguards or whatever yeah these reactors aren't like chernobyl they have shielding within shielding and and safety nets to prevent any exposure um yeah i'm i wish that i could recall the other article that we had because we talked about it um but yeah this is a there was something about this um, maybe if it pops up again, we'll be able to talk about it. So at any rate, let's keep going. Um, the next article is over in non sequitur news. Chinese scientists claim star Wars like laser submarines can blast us satellites. Chinese researchers believe submarine fired lasers could destroy satellites. Uh, a laser could target more of the growing satellite network, uh, essential to military operations, but us experts are skeptical. A scheme like that would work. Chinese scientists claim that it's possible to destroy it, including SpaceX's Starlink system using lasers mounted on submarines. And you can claim all you want. Michael Peck over at businessinsider.com put the article together. Yeah, go ahead, claim. I mean, why would you do that though? Why, why put it on a sub? You still have to surface. You know, it's not like you're going to fire it from under the water. Right, but you can be sneaky in a sub. Yeah, I don't think that people are... Yes, that's a technical term. Yeah, sneaky. Um, so it says here, um, American experts question the feasibility of mounting a power-hungry energy weapon on a sub, but China and other potential American adversaries are looking for ways to destroy or degrade the satellite-based communications and targeting that has given the uh, U.S. military an edge and researchers at the Chinese Navy Submarine Academy are confident that the submarines are the answers. So yeah, I guess they could have multiple nuclear power plants generating enough power. Submarine with a megawatt class solid state laser weapon installed in its midsection could stay submerged while it raised a retractable optoelectric mast to fire at satellites before diving back down to depth. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I'm sure it's possible. It's going to be loud as hail. So good luck. Um, the U.S. government recently warned that Russia is also developing an anti-satellite with a nuclear warhead. A laser, by contrast, offers the potential to fire at many space targets, but also comes with many complexities of submarine operations. I don't think that they'll be able to do that anytime soon but okay this Even seems I... like something like an old um action movie or something yeah with some ludicrous plot hunt for red october kind of stuff one ping only Beep. 
So uh, in addition to destroying satellites, these subs could also blast aircraft or land entire. Okay, so this is the uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt segment of the article. Laser subs could also shield China's ballistic missile marine uh, submarines from detection. The escorting submarine can first use the laser weapon to interfere with or destroy overhead satellites in the sea area, making it difficult for the enemy's space-based surveillance system to function, thereby achieving the concealment of missile launches. True. Now, all of this is what if kind of, you know, Marvel Cinematic Universe. I guess it's human cinematic universe. The HCU. Anyway. Last article. It's over in non sequitur news. Woman finds a 200 year old sword in a riverbed and is now queen. It was a bit of an out of body experience. The waiter said of the discovery waiter oh that's interesting woman finds sword dating back two centuries in river astonishing there's actually a video here let me click it it's muted so found a sword in an english river using a device that basically calms the water so that she can look down inside um and i guess there there she blows Cool. This is going to be a first is what the video says. Oh, and they use a rake to pry it up. A 200 year old sword in a riverbed. I bet archaeologists are just going crazy just watching this. throwing up watching this thing. Oh, God. I mean, it's only 200 years old, right? Is that all? So uh, while indulging her passion for wild waiting, Jane Eastman, known as my ordinary treasure um, spotted the old military weapon. Basically my hobby or obsession is to go in rivers searching for lost history, ruining, ruining the archeological and historical record of it being there, but maybe there wasn't any, let's assume that it. Right. Do they have the rule? Like, um, I think it was Ireland had the rule about like no metal detector. Yeah. Discoveries or something. Yeah. Um, and you're not allowed to actually pick it up. You just leave it there and then notify people. Um, that's how that person got those bones sh- sh- shipped to them or something like that. The archaeologist received these things like professionally. Right, like anonymously mailed or yeah. whatever. They're like, we don't want anything to do with this. So here it is. So uh, the sword is, uh, with its extensive blade and brass handle immediately caught our attention. Um, it's a really gorgeous sweeping shape. Uh, brand, the handle is brass, which doesn't rust. I just thought it looked like something out of Pirates of the Caribbean or Caribbean. Um, it was a bit out of body experience. There was no mistaking what it was. I was very confused as to why it was lying there. Um, cause somebody dropped it there. Right. Because it hadn't been disturbed or the <laughs> silt shifted or whatever. Yep. So they delved into research to uncover the origins of the weapon. Her efforts paid off when a Belgian sword collector reached out to her via Instagram, offering valuable insights. According to the collector, the sword was likely a Dutch or Belgian infantry saber, possibly dating back to 1815. Matt Easton is an expert from Easton Antique Arms, later supported this identification. So viewers of Eastman's viral video were captivated by the sword's discovery with many speculating on how it ended up in the river. I don't really care about speculation folks. So, um, Eastman herself is curious about the sword's journey. She wondered whether it was brought back from war or if it belonged to a collector, if it belonged to a collector, it wouldn't be in the river. <laughs> no, um, I don't think that's the source. And, and now, It says here that she hopes that further cleaning and examination will reveal more about its past. But they say this is far from a remarkable find in the collector's treasure trove. Her personal collection boasts military items like World War II badges, helmets, rings, even a gold watch from 1920s that she wears daily after having it restored. Eastman cleans up and keeps all of her magical findings. They're not magical, they're historical. Right. There's a reason but why that maybe ring was... they're <laughs> yeah. they might be magical with the treasure finder, or they're cursed, and that 
makes for great anyway that's it folks well we're gonna go wild waiting all the way back to ohm town's front page and we're gonna call it a night for august 3rd 2024 we might be able to get now it's getting i don't know we'll talk we're gonna try and reset and get a couple more episodes in and we'll be caught up so we're calling it a, a night for the time machine because it's just shy of an hour and it's going to overheat if we don't turn it off. I am Merwat and up above me is the sentient AI from the future. Good night, hometown citizens. Thanks for joining us for non sequitur news. Oh, my metal detector went off and it says bye. <laughs>